بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We're still discussing the chapter that deals with dua, with invocation from the gardens of the righteous, Riyadh al-Salihin, which was compiled by Imam al-Nawawi. And we go to the first hadith with us, and this hadith is number 1465. And Labib will read it for us, inshallah. An-Nu'man bin Bashir radiallahu anhu reported, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Dua, supplication is worship. Dua huwa al-ibada. This is a hadith that al-Nu'man ibn Bashir ibn Sa'd, may Allah be pleased with him and with his father, narrated to us. Now the Prophet is telling us that invocation, dua is al-ibada. And one would say, okay, what about my prayer? What about my fasting? What about my charity? Isn't this also part of ibadah? The answer is yes. But the Prophet ﷺ is highlighting to us the importance of dua. As if all of your worship is in the dua. And we spoke before that dua is divided into two types. Dua of asking, dua al-mas'ala, and dua of worship, dua al-ibadah. So I will not repeat this. Once again, now when the Prophet says alayhi salatu salam, invocation or a dua is al-ibadah. What is al-ibadah? Why did Allah Azza wa Jal create us? As in Surah Al-Dhariyat, وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ So Allah did not create the jinn or the humans except for one purpose and one purpose alone and that is to worship him. But a lot of us are confused when it comes to worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. So many people have limited worshipping Allah to a number of rak'ahs they offer per day and refraining from fasting and drinking a month in a year. And that is it. They think that this is the ibadah mentioned and intended. But this is not true. Ibadah is much greater than this. And that is why the scholars have defined al-ibadah in a very nice way. So they say it is a name for all the actions, whether they are done or they are said, whether they are external or internal, that Allah Azza wa Jal loves and is pleased with. Plus, to disconnect yourself from anything that goes against it or displeases Allah Azza wa Jal. This is a definition of ibadah. So it is a definition or a name for all the acts that Allah loves and is pleased with. This means that it's not only prayer. If you, for example, are kind and respectful to your parents, is this ibadah? Does Allah love it? Yes, then it is ibadah. If you are kind to your neighbors, if you connect to the next of kin, if you pray, if you say good things, if you intend, because it is internal and external, so even your fear from Allah is a form of worship. Even your love for Allah is a form of worship. Your tawakkul, trust, dependence, and reliance on Allah Azza wa Jal is one of the greatest forms of worship. And this is internal. No one sees this except Allah Azza wa Jal. If you refrain from what angers Allah, so you do not say obscene words, you do not backbite, you do not lie, you do not cheat. All of this is considered to be a form of worship, ibadah. The best thing is that even if you do something 
with the intention, though it is permissible, not a form of worship. It becomes a form of worship. So you wake up at 2 a.m., you want to pray night prayer, tahajjud, but you're sleepy. So you go to the kitchen and prepare a glass of or a cup of coffee. And you drink it so that it would make you able to pray with concentration. It wards off your drowsiness and your sleeping. By this intention, making the coffee and drinking it and enjoying it becomes a form of worship. Someone who helps others and he intends that he is doing something that pleases Allah, cleaning the streets so that people would not be harmed by the dirt in it. It's a good job, it is a ibadah. Putting the morsel as in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, in your wife's mouth, this is charity. This is ibadah. So now imagine the doors of ibadah that you have. When your father goes shopping and he has groceries and he tells you to come and help him carry them up to the apartment. Going down and carrying it and helping your father to please Allah Azza wa Jal, this is a ibadah. And the sky is the limit. And this concept, this understanding, no one can come and say, listen, ibadah is in the masjid in Ramadan. But ibadah, worship, has nothing to do with politics has nothing to do with economics, has nothing to do with art. So the movie industry, the songs, the drawings, making sculptures, all of this is art, has nothing to do with ibadah. This is wrong. From this definition, we know and learn that Islam controls every single thing in our lives. Nothing is out. You cannot come and say, listen, Beside the Quran and Sunnah, what's the ruling on this? You cannot leave the Quran and Sunnah aside because they control all of your life. And that is why we have to understand the concept of ibadah, of worship. Now, worship has to be based on knowledge. Because if you do not base it on knowledge, then you have a problem. You will worship Allah on ignorance. And this is not what Allah Azza wa Jal said. Allah says in the Quran, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ First of all, know that there is no God worthy of being worshipped except Allah. And then, ask Allah for forgiveness. So you do not know how to ask Allah for forgiveness first. You must have the knowledge to ask Allah for forgiveness or otherwise you will not know Allah Azza wa Jal to begin with without this proper knowledge and the more you have knowledge the easier worship becomes go and pray oh every day i pray fajr every day every day can't we have one day off no you have to pray every day it's difficult it's hard when you know the reward ah, i didn't know that that if you pray fajr in jama'ah allah would write to you as if you have prayed the whole night prayer wow aisha as if you have prayed half of the night. Wow, that's even greater. Wudu, it's too cold. I cannot make wudu, or it's too hot. Well, if you know the reward that the Prophet says, Islam, whoever makes a good wudu, and after he finishes, he says, Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik, ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. What will happen? If you make wudu and you say this, the angels write it on a piece of paper and then it is sealed with a seal that would not be cracked until the day of judgment it will be preserved for you how many times do you make wudu oh a lot and how many times say this dua never and those who say it how many times do you always think that ya allah this is will happen so i'm saying it and it makes wudu much easier for you so the more you know the easier the ibadah is and when an individual makes dua this is ibadah because is he calling an angel is he calling a jinn is he calling a messenger no he is 
making his ibadah sincere for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal when he makes dua. And that is why if you want to know whether your dua is sincere to Allah Azza wa Jal or not, look at how long you will make the dua. Because if you make the dua for two, three days and then you leave, said, I made dua and Allah did not answer me. Then this is a sign that your dua is not sincere for the sake of Allah. But if you make dua, you must remain steadfast, making this dua for a month, for a year, for 10 years, until Allah Azza wa opens the door for you. Never ever give up from Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala because as stated before, you are worshipping Allah the more you make dua. Because the Prophet says, Asam dua is worship. So the more you ask Allah Azza wa Jal, the more you get the reward from Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. Can we ask people to make dua for us? It's an issue of dispute among scholars. Some say that this is not appropriate because your tawakkul, your trust, is not on Allah but rather on that individual. Others say that it is permissible and they report a hadith from the sunnah that the companions used to ask one another to make dua for them as in the hadith of Abu Darda when his son-in-law was going for hajj his wife Umm Darda said to her son-in-law make dua for us. So when he left he met his father-in-law, Abu Darda, may Allah be pleased with him. And he told him that this is strange. My mother-in-law asked me to make dua for her. And he approved of that and he said, you make dua for us. And this means that it is permissible, inshallah. We have a short break. Stay tuned. And inshallah, we'll be right back. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. So do we have any questions? Yes, Labib. Sheikh, as you gave the evidence that asking someone to make dua for us, it's allowed. So what if someone says that a person is dead, he might have been a righteous person, a saleh, and I make dua in his name. So is it allowed for me to make dua in his name? That's a very good question. Now, what is the ruling on asking someone who's dead, who's pious, who's known to have been righteous for dua? And there is no difference of opinion among scholars that this is prohibited. Because Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمَا أَنْتَ بِمُسْمِعٍ مَنْ فِي الْقُبُورِ That you, Prophet of Allah, would not make those who are in the graves hear. And we all know that the people in the grave do not hear. So by supplicating to them, by calling them, this is unacceptable and it's considered to be one of the forms of shirk when the people of Mecca were killed in the battle of Badr the Prophet after three days والسلام, ordered them to be thrown in one of the dry wells and buried so after they were thrown and buried the Prophet said والسلام, Ya Aba Jahl Ya Utbah ibn Rabi'ah Ya Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, Ya Walid ibn Utba, Ya Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And he's calling them one by one. Have you seen what you were promised? Because by Allah, we have seen what we were promised. The Prophet Hassan was promised of victory. And he saw that. Now for you, you were promised hell. So the Prophet is addressing them. And Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, as any other Muslim, knows from Islam that the dead do not hear. So he said, O Prophet of Allah, do you speak to people whose bodies have been decayed and become rotten? He said, I know Umar. By Allah, you do not hear me except as they hear me because Allah made them hear me which means that he has given his approval to Umar. Yes, true, the dead don't hear. But this is what? An exceptional case. Likewise, when a person dies, he doesn't know what the people are doing to him. 
washing him, shrouding him, praying salat on him, and then taking him to his grave. He would only start to hear after they leave. He would hear their shoes and slippers as they're leaving. And this answers the question where people say, what about the out-of-body experience? And they claim that people die for a minute or two and their souls are out and they see the doctors and the surgery room and then they go back to their bodies and talk about their experience. This is nonsense. Whoever dies does not come back to life. Not even the Prophet ﷺ. Not even the Prophet ﷺ. Allah said in the Quran, إِنَّ كَمَيِّتُنْ وَإِنَّهُمْ مَيِّتُونَ Allah said in the Quran that the Prophet ﷺ will die and he's dead. But he's dead not like us. Yet in his grave, he's alive, a life of barzakh, which is different from our life. Because if he's alive like us, we would have gotten him out. If he's alive like us, come and solve our problems, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But he's not. Allah Azza wa Jal has made it clear that whoever dies does not come back to this life. Now people say that he hears us and he can answer us and this is not from Islam. And that is why all the history of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, none of them went to the Prophet and said, Oh Prophet of Allah, ask Allah for this and that. In Sahih al-Bukhari, when it was drought at the time of Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, they went and asked Allah for rain. And Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, said, Oh Allah, at the time of your Prophet, when he was alive, we used to go to him and he would ask you for rain. Now he's dead, so we ask Abbas, his uncle, to ask you for rain. And Abbas raised his hands and he supplicated for rain and they got rain. No one said, why not go to the grave of the Prophet ﷺ and ask him directly, because he hears us and he sees us and tell him, O Prophet of Allah, ask Allah to do this for us. No one does this. Why? Because they know it is shirk. So to answer your question, Nabi, it is not permissible to ask someone who is dead for any help. And among the issues also that nowadays are spreading among the Muslims, they have a problem of a hadith which is fabricated, it's weak, it is not authentic, which states that if you are in a desert and you lose your way, so you shout and say, O oh, servants of Allah, guide me. Who are the servants of Allah? They say angels, jinn, and they will guide you back to your root. Now the hadith is not authentic, yet people fight on it. They say, no, this is permissible because it is like going to the doctor and asking him, to help me in getting the medicine. So I'm asking the righteous jinn and the angels to guide me. This is shirk. Ask only Allah Azza wa Jal. So this issue is prevailing, unfortunately, among some of the Muslims. And they say, no, 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 this is not a shirk. This is means of shirk. What is the difference? It's all shirk. Yani, it's OK to ask the jinn or the angels for help in such issues. They say, yes, it's OK. Okay, then I know this imposter and he says that I perform surgical operations with my nail, fingernails. And I have righteous jinn, a consulto of six surgeons of the jinn. MashaAllah, they're very good. So you have a problem, you come to me and he says this, Bismillah, and he opens you up and he takes the cancer and he takes all the tumors and then fix it and go. How did he do this? said, I have righteous jinn. Is it halal? He said, no, this is major shirk. So how do you ask the assistance of the jinn and say halal and now this surgeon, you say it's haram, it is all shirk and it's not permissible. Yes, Sahih. Sheikh, if we do dua for our brothers, so the angel says, Amin. And same to you, as we ask for the health of our brother. So can we make this a routine uh, that if I need something, then I'll say that, Oh Allah, please grant my uh, brother this thing. So in return, that I will also get these things. 
Well, this is like asking, where is your ear? And you say, it's here. Instead of saying, it's here. If you want something from Allah Azza wa Jal, why do you ask it for your brother? So the angel would say, I mean to you, ask directly to Allah Azza wa Jal. Oh, Allah grant me this. But the hadith is encouraging you to make dua for your brothers, not to ask Allah something for you so that the angel would say Amin to you. And, and this reminds me of a story that a man was with his wife and one of his friends was calling him and he said, Inshallah, I'm getting married. So he said to him, may Allah Azza wa Jal grant you a beautiful, righteous, practicing sister as a wife. As he finished his sentence, he got smacked by his wife. And he said, why are you doing this? He said, ah, you're doing this so that the angel would say, and for you as well. Don't ever ask Allah such a, a, a thing. So this shows you that some people over exaggerate and do things that are not needed. You ask Allah Azza wa straight for something and Allah would answer you. But if you know your brother is in need or something and you ask Allah for him, as a bonus, Allah would appoint an angel to say, I mean as well. Sheikh, as you have mentioned in the earlier episodes that the wazaif and all these things are not permissible. But we know that the Quran is Shifa. It's one of the name of Quran is Shifa for the people. So if a person, he finds out some particular ayah which gets him the solution to a problem. For example, the Sahaba, they found out that in Surah Fatiha there is Shifa. And here also in subcontinents you have a particular ayah for some issue. Or like for example, Surah Yasin, which is the most widely read in cases of uh, illness or other problems. So is this permissible? First of all, to cure yourself from an illness through using the Quran, this is definitely a valid statement because the Quran is shifa, is a healing. However, to believe that a particular ayah cures from a particular illness without evidence from the Quran or from the Sunnah or from the companions, may Allah be pleased with them all, then this is not acceptable and it becomes sort of an innovation. So you have to stick in terms of wadifa or whatever to the verses and sunnah dua which the Prophet ﷺ has taught us. If it's good dua that is not part of the sunnah but it is good, the Prophet told us you can use this without any problem. From the Quran, you have to have evidence. So if someone says that I would like to cure my knee pain, I have pain in my knee, so I recite tabbat yada abi lahabim watab, tabbat yada abi lahabim watab. What does this have to do with that? Nothing. So this is an innovation. This is all the time we have until we meet next time. Fi amanillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. He created the universe. To him belong the heavens and the earth. The ever living, he is the first. He's the owner of mercy. He sent his messengers to warn his creatures.